Alright, we are live. We're gonna make sure every all the audio is coming through. So, Jeff, can I get you to say something? Yeah, good Jeff, morning. I'm Jeff Sargent, I'm for simulation. You don't need to introduce yourself. Just want to make sure audio is still coming through on the stream. Liam? Hi, I'm Liam. How's everybody doing? Hi, I'm Liam. How's everybody doing? Okay. All right. We can get started then. So, hello and welcome, everyone. My name is Sergeant Z Dog, or Kevin, on the On Target Simulations team. I will let the other fine gentlemen introduce themselves. Jeff? Hi, I'm Iron Mike Golfer. Jeff, uh, developer at On Target Simulations for Flash Point And Liam? Hi, everybody. I'm Liam. Uh, you might have seen me on Humble War Gamers yesterday. I'm a brand manager for Matrix Games, and on the Discords, I am uh, Sev. All right. And today we have for you guys, we're going to be going through a new uh, scouting and recon kind of tutorial video. Uh, this is going to be a companion stream to go with a uh, video that's going up on YouTube. It hasn't gone up quite yet. It'll go up at the end of the stream, but we figured we would start with where we're at now. So here's that video for you guys. The Cold War battlefield is a lethal place. If a target can be seen, it can be destroyed. Finding the enemy while keeping your main force hidden is an essential component of modern mechanized warfare. By using your reconnaissance units correctly, you can ensure the safe and effective deployment of your main force. On scenario start, the first thing a player should do is take a look at their staff briefings and intelligence report. These sections provide projections of enemy strength in the area and their location. While these reports are only an estimate, you can use them to create a plan for reconnaissance and surveillance. Both NATO and the Warsaw Pact have access to recon units, which are specially trained troops that can operate outside of their headquarters command radius without any penalties. These scouts are usually mounted in armored cars like the BRDM, helicopters like the Kiowa, IFVs like the Bradley, or even on motorcycles. They are also frequently equipped with powerful optics. These scouts are used to move ahead of your main force to find the enemy. You can detect concealed ambushes or enemy defensive lines through careful reconnaissance. Remember that to take advantage of your recon screen, you need to have your main body far enough back to have time to react. If your main force of tanks or mechanized infantry are too close to your scouts, you won't have time to change their orders to prepare for contact. Recon units will frequently take casualties when encountering resistance. Use the SOP feature to ensure that your scouts withdraw when they detect a nearby enemy or take fire. Having artillery deployed and on call can help your recon units survive by shelling revealed enemy positions. While you don't want to be reckless with your scouts, it's better to risk them than your main force. Knowing where the enemy isn't can be just as valuable as knowing where they are. Discovering an unguarded road can turn a costly frontal assault into a decisive flank attack. And knowing what routes are safe allows you to rapidly transfer troops. By using your scouts to clear terrain, you can create safe corridors to rapidly transfer units from one sector to another. Scouts are also useful in static positions. If deployed on high ground, they can observe a wide area and are difficult to detect if in cover. From these positions, they can spot targets for artillery or detect enemy movement. Good observation posts usually overlook roads or bridges that troops would use when road marching through the area or overwatch a position you plan to assault. By leveraging your reconnaissance and surveillance assets, you can place your troops where they need to be to maximize their damage and survivability. All right, so there's the video. If you guys want to watch that again, that of course will come up on YouTube soon. And mm -hmm. we're going to go into talking about that today. So we were planning on doing, this is the fourth scenario in um, Big Red One, right? Do I have that right, Jeff? I think Big Red One's the name of the campaign. Yes, that's that's correct. 
Okay. So, uh, for those that have been tuning into the developer streams that I've been doing the last few day, uh, last few weeks, uh, this is the scenario after the one that I'm currently on. Uh, so, assuming you don't embarrassingly defeat yourself. Um, I'm going to leave this on the Grognar difficulty because obviously uh, if you can see all the enemy units, uh, there's not as much need for Scouts and Recon. So, uh, Jeff, I think we still use uh, the spotting values when it comes to what you can spot for the enemy on the individual unit scale, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so certainly there is a lot of that that goes into if you guys see in the game your units aren't engaging the enemy it's just a matter of uh they haven't they don't have a clear line of sight like they know the enemy is there but they don't have a good shot that they can take um so i'm gonna probably kind of move past some of the uh scenario specific info because we just kind of wanted to focus on the scouts and recon element right Uh, so I'm going to pull up the intelligence here because if you guys haven't seen this screen, it's just immensely important. Um, this first page just kind of gives you kind of the broad overview. So uh, skipping past the scenario info, basically we've got the Russians here in the northeast and eastern portion of the map that are going to be moving into our position. If I close this real quick, we can see we have a lot of prepared uh, positions already, uh, thanks to the German Fallschirmjäger unit that's attached to it, that we're joining. Um, and just so that everybody knows, Jeff, do you want to go into what these different uh, symbols on the map are here? Yeah, sure, go ahead and zoom in. Okay, so... Um... The uh, circles with the spikes on them, that's, those are improved positions. So you, you think, think of guys being physically dug in, have overhead cover, and that, that sort of thing. So it's going to uh, really, um, especially And we for, can actually shift these positions around. Right. And especially for dismounted infantry, it makes a huge difference. Then we've got these kind of spiky border edges. And these are just like tank barricades. Yeah, I think that's what those are. It's it, they're they're um, and they only apply according to, according to that hex side. Not not they're not multi-directional. Yep. And then the other ones I believe are um, mines along the hex edges. Okay. Cool. So we have the the Falsham Jaeger, which are uh, for those who aren't as familiar with. Uh, German, these are going to be like German air cav or German paratroopers, right? Paratroopers. Paratroopers. So, um, oops, uh, oops, we want the intelligence. So, we've got the Russians moving in to this prepared position. We've got that the German paratroopers have prepared, and we've got a bunch of um, American 1st Infantry Division and a bit of first armored division i believe coming along for the ride so i think it's mostly just helicopters from first armored division is that right um i think so look in the southeast corner of the map real quick southeast oh sorry wrong yep your, your other east right <laughs> yeah uh so we've got uh some 334 uh I don't see any of the helicopters here. The helicopters are in the southwest where you okay, were. Yeah. yeah, so we do have the uh, 334th Armored. Uh, and they joined us in Scenario 3. Actually, we might have even had some of them in Scenario 2, I believe, from this campaign. Uh, and they'll be, I think, probably pretty pivotal, pivotal at... Um, getting flanking attacks on the enemy as they move across these roads. 
Um, so I really like the enemy sit rep screen, especially early on, because it lets us know ballpark of how much stuff the enemy has. So we can see they've got 50 to 60 recon units, uh, over 80 tank subunits. And there's no like max on this, right, Jeff? This will, you know, if they've got 150, it's just this was all we were able to count before we had to boogie, right? Right. Yeah, so once you get past uh, an estimate, or once you get past a 70 to 80 estimate, it's just the line, the enemy ranks are too deep. We're not able to count them. So this could be 150 tanks that we need to go through. Hopefully it's not, but it might well be. Uh, they have over 80 armored carriers. That's not too surprising. They have a corresponding number of infantry that they're carrying along with it. The, uh, they have 10 to 20 self-propelled anti-tank. That's actually not a lot, uh, I feel like, compared to some of the other scenarios we've seen. Uh, they tend to have a, a lot more self-propelled anti-tank relative. Not quite such a small fraction, I guess I should say. 50 to 60 anti-tank subunits. These are going to be mostly infantry. I don't think they have a lot of towed anti-tank. Um, over 80 headquarters subunits. Over 80 air defense. So our helicopters and any CAS we get... It's going to be pretty hard pressed with 80 air defense subunits, 70 to 80 artillery, not as much as they'd like to have. Um, that's self-propelled artillery. They have another 20 to 30 towed artillery pieces. This could also be infantry mortars and 80 utility vehicles. So the parts that I like to look at here is 80 tanks, over 80 tanks, over 80 APCs, and 50 to 60 recon. That tends to be, I feel like, the dominant. Um, controls here. We do have a bit of an advantage here. This is a scenario that starts us at midnight where NATO has a significant visibility advantage because we have a lot of stuff that's got night vision, whereas the Russians have very little. Um, 1989, so they've got some night vision stuff, right, Jeff? Yeah, it's... Uh... It's it's shortwave infrared, so it, you need you need either like moonlight illumination, or uh, 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 infrared searchlights, which which most of the tanks will have mounted on. Tanks and, and IFVs will have those mounted on the mounted on the turret next to the main gun. Yeah, of course the downside with a searchlight is that light beam rather obviously points to you, but uh, being able to see it all is better than not being able to see. So, uh, and still, it's still like pretty short range. Yeah. So we've got uh, visual limits, uh, not too bad, pretty mild wind. Uh, and we're pretty much just going to be in this first bar on the weather. Uh, kind of a low cloud ceiling, though. 320 to 460 meters. Um, so any of the high elevation would actually almost be in fog. So this is going to give us reduced effectiveness for smart munitions. Uh, I don't think any of our own artillery will have that, but I think some of the Russian artillery might. Uh, but this is mostly going to be long range like tomahawks, right? The smart munitions. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, we, we, you're not going to see tomahawks in this scenario, but yeah, but be, <laughs> yeah. a little yeah, far inland be, you know, precision guided munitions. So if you if you had, you know, guided guided artillery projectiles like Copperhead or something like that. Yeah, uh, there is also going to be reduced detection and identification of aircraft due to low cloud ceilings, which will be a significant boon to our uh, swarm of helicopters that are joining us. Uh, they'll have, they won't be as easily spotted by all that enemy air defense. Um, and NBC operations will have reduced effectiveness uh, thanks to the lack of wind, which is good. I think I saw, yes, there is a little bit of a chemical attack. It'll stay there. We don't have to worry about that blowing around. On the other hand, given how far away it is from our own position, it would really just run into the Russians. But um, 
Hey, Z, could you go back to the uh, enemy suit rep real quick? Yeah. I missed, I missed, did they end up identifying the enemy unit that they're expect, we're expecting to see? Oh, yes. Um, I believe it's the... I saw that, I could have sworn. 48th Motor Rifle Division. Okay. Um, and they're the ones that you've been, I think, primarily engaged with throughout this campaign, I believe. Um, is there any indicator like what kind of regiment it is? Let's see. That we're going to be seeing. Uh, we're we'll we going to we, we're gonna see the whole division. Enemy sit rep. Let's see. Not here. I don't know if. Okay. Uh, our BGM 109 in this title, did I get that right? Are they out of scope? Well, I don't know the answer to that. Do you know our BGM 109s? Um, in Central Storm or Southern Storm? The, the, the question was what? Our BGM 109s in Southern Storm. Tomahawks, right? I honestly don't know what the uh, that is the designation for Tomahawk. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yes, I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't even know if it's in the data. I mean, you know. Yeah. We don't. We don't, we don't, we don't play around cruise missiles at, at this point yet. Yeah, and of course this is Southern Storm, so it's pretty. You know, this is Southern Germany, pretty far inland. You might get in the northern. I don't know what the actual range of a Tomahawk is off the top of my head. I want to say it's like a couple hundred miles. Well, I would suspect for the scale of the game, too, right? That would be um, a bit outside the scope of a tactical battle. It would be more missing bridges um, or, like, uh, damaged infrastructure uh, yeah. than, uh, than actually being modeled in the game. Yeah, certainly, uh, if you guys wanted uh, to, you could, in creating a custom scenario, uh, you could write into the data file your own artillery unit. Uh, that's an off-map asset. Give it whatever attributes you think are appropriate to a tomahawk. You're at full time. Well, yeah. So uh, when we get to doing a Northern Storm DLC, uh, we might see them added in there. Um, but yeah, I think as uh, Liam and Jeff were saying, you know, this is uh, a tactical war game and Tomahawks uh, are almost more of a strategic asset. They're kind of somewhere between st strategic and tactical assets. But I don't think you are in the span of this scenario is relatively long at eight hours um, in the span of an eight hour period going, I need a Tomahawk right this minute. So. I will say in uh, the previous uh, iteration of Flashpoint campaigns, Red Storm, I did have the pleasure of calling it a tactical nuke. Um, and that, that <laughs> is that's very uh, <laughs> it's, it's quite fun. It's very fun. And we have, uh, I believe, all of that same capacity in, uh, here in Southern Storm as well. So, all right. So, we have uh, the bridges here to the north are knocked out. Uh, so that means that we probably don't need. What is this? What are these guys over here? These are. Ah, it looks like this is. First, fourth. This is Charlie Company. Uh, okay, so this is, it looks like a cavalry yeah. group. Yeah, it's quarter cav. Yes. And this is the recon section. So, now, Jeff, just because I've been trying to figure this out on my own time, these calf scouts, this is just like, Two got two guys that can dismount out of the Brad out of the back of the Bradley. Yeah, right? they 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 got they got two two functions. One is is to operate dismounted like in an observation post, you can stash mm -hmm. your vehicle. The other thing is reloading the toes on the Brad. Right. You know, so so they got so there's no there's very few there's like two troop seats in the back of the M3, and instead right. there's additional missile racks. Yeah. So the M3's uh the M3 Bradley for anyone who doesn't know is 
basically extra ammo versus an M2, but that ammo's got to go somewhere, so you lose some seating. So these M3 Bradleys are really the bulk of what this reconnaissance unit is. These dismounts are more for providing kind of security while you're not operating the vehicle, or if you need a, a stealthier observation than what the Bradley can do itself. Um, so we've got some reconnaissance here. This is going to be the company headquarters. And then uh, the oomph of the recon company is a couple of platoons of Abrams. And then we have a couple of supporting mortars. We have, this is a nice three batteries of, uh, the M109 is the Paladin, right? Nope, I moved one of them well, around. There's a... The, the newest version of the M109 is the Paladin. Oh, okay. These are probably earlier, like A1s. Uh, they are, in fact, A2s, actually. A2s, okay. Yeah. This is 1989, after all. Mm -hmm. uh, I, but then... I think I think Paladin came online in the 90s, early 90s. Did it? Okay. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, anywhere you've got the 109s. Uh, you've also got the fists that serve as spotters. Um, we've got some air defense. I never feel like uh, we have enough Stinger missiles. Especially, <laughs> we're, so this scenario, I think everything is locked at like 90% ammo cap, which means since we have to round down th ammo, uh, all of our Stinger teams only have three missiles, which is just utterly painful. Because um, as good as the Stingers are, their efficacy is not great, but it's still better than the Vulcans that make up the rest of our air defense. Uh, so we've got lots of recons. We've got a bunch of Kiowas, which are purely scouting helicopters. They're unarmed. Does that give them a smaller size category? They're profile size 3. Yeah, they're a little bit smaller airframe. Ah, yes. They're much smaller in our game terms. Profile size 9 on the Apaches. So the Apaches are much bigger in terms of how easy they are to engage. Um, but the Apaches, what do we got on these? It's like four Hellfires or something. Oh, no. Uh, even... Be eight yeah, eight at a max. Uh, again, we're at that 90%, got to round down. Uh, so they're still carrying six Hellfires, um, as well as a number of HE rockets. And I'm guessing... Okay, so we've got a bunch of these in teams of three, which is nice to have uh, teams of three. I feel like we had a previous scenario where it was only a team of two. Um, Got three infantry companies, it looks like. Or, I'm sorry, three infantry platoons. One company of infantry uh, with a platoon. Or... No, I had that right. Three companies. I can speak. Three co infantry companies, uh, one armored company here. Uh, we have an anti tank company. I love these things. These M901s. I don't think they're as small as the Bradleys. Profile size four versus a profile size three. Oh, they're smaller than the Bradleys, yeah. And I feel like these M901s shoot faster than the Bradleys too. I think they have a slightly more um, robust reload system. And do they have two tubes on they that do. they launch from? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that gives them a, a better rate of fire. Um, and I don't know, do they have uh, better spotting gear to get better target acquisition with their toes as well? Well, the, actually, the rate of fire should be the same on both of those. And, is it? Okay. And, and, it, and they both have thermal thermal imaging sites. One of the big differences, though, is is that um, the sensors and the, the box launcher are on a mast. So it's a mass-mounted weapon. Mm -hmm. and mass mounted mass mass mounted sites so uh if you get them in some some good cover they they actually could be 
a little more survivable than a Bradley that's fully exposed. Right. They if you've ever seen, go ahead. Oh, so, sorry, it was just if you've ever seen those things in a hold down position, it's it's absolutely beautiful. It's just the launcher that's exposed, and that's it. Yeah, and that is rather advantageous. Uh, they have they do great work. The only problem I've had with them is uh, the darn Russian helicopters keep finding them. <laughs> And, 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 they're, and, they're, and, and they're more vulnerable to artillery than a Bradley is because it has yes. it, it, it's aluminum and it's a lot lighter armored. Yeah. Um, and we've got what is this? This is ah okay. This is another reconnaissance section. Oh, this is I think did I see air cav. Um, this is another reconnaissance section. Um, this, however, they're in M113s rather than Bradley's. It's so I that's, guess... that's a battalion scout platoon. And they, okay. They have, they have M113s. The, the cavalry troops, right, whether division cavalry or from an armored cavalry regiment, those will have Bradley's. Yeah. So this and, is, and and even later on, you know, um, like once you get to like 1990, and even some units in 1989, the battalion scouts traded in their M113s for for Humvees. Yeah. Um, we have a mortar section, and the the headquarters for that mortar section. Uh, we've got some engineers who seem to have snuck ahead, I guess, probably helping the Germans dig in. And uh, these guys with their satchel charges and short-range weapons almost kind of serve as another recon unit for us at this point, right? Now that their engineering role is kind of finished. Yeah, you, and... could use, you could use them that way. Um, real life, what usually happens is they get integrated into into one of the platoons of a company. Okay. And, and then they fight as infantry. Gotcha. Okay. And 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 even some of them, depending upon on um, on when and where, some of them will even have like an armor weapons, like dragons. Yeah. Sadly, these do not. Uh, that is uh, definitely one of the. <laughs> One of the situations I found is it's hard to get enough anti-tank weapons. It's hard to get enough um, anti-air weapons going. And then over here, we've got uh, three armored companies. And this is uh, Cavalry Reconnaissance Platoon. This They don't call them platoons, though. Um, well, the, the 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 entire thing is is a platoon. So is it okay? Yeah, you got, a, you got a platoon headquarters in two sections, right? And the, and the and the headquarters will operate as a as a section doing reconnaissance tasks. Yeah, so, they have. So what so what you've got there is a is a line battalion. It's a it's an armor. It's a tank heavy battalion task force. So uh, American wise, you're you're going to have four companies, um, a mixture of tanks and 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 mech normally. You'll have a you'll have a, a mortar platoon and you'll have a scout platoon, yep. and that's that's pretty much the cookie cutter for for an American battalion. And so for those that so we've got first, second, and I believe, well, uh, I guess it's A, B, and D companies are our armored companies. Uh, C company is our um, mechanized infantry company. And then we have the uh, scout platoon that is attached to the. Uh, it's the division brigade. No, no, it's battalion. That's, that's battalion. battalion. That's Sorry. Yeah. Yes. And then the mortar section that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so. And I have to admit, uh, being in the uh, recon it is not a job that I would want because from a gameplay perspective they're they're the sacrificial lamb 
<laughs> to, to spring any traps, right? Um, obviously, well, that, we that's, don't that's, want them to die. That's but. one. Te- that's one technique. Yeah, I, but I we mean, want them it, it, in this you, scenario, like a couple kilometers ahead of us, two kilometers probably. What, probably you had okay. So what's the distance you want between between elements? At that and that's a good question. Uh, right. Know, there's two ways to look at that. One is you you base it on terrain, right? So mm-hmm. you you know so when you make contact, you want to make contact with the smallest survivable you know force package that you can you don't want to make contact with everybody all at once because once you make contact it's like flypaper right it's really hard to break contact it's, it it's is really, really hazardous so what you want to do is is you want to make contact with the smallest force you can that is survivable so that last piece there you look at that scalp platoon right and there's there's a wealth of hand armor systems to your front so like how survivable are they Right. right. All right. Not very. Uh, they could shoot back pretty well, but right, right. So you know, talking about contact, if you want to make contact with those guys using those guys, then you want to make it like as far away as you can and visually not shooting, right? That, so that that's mm-hmm. one thing to consider. Now, if you don't have uh, enough relief where you can put a hill or a ridge be- between the guys, whoever it is that's out front, and and your main body. Then you start to think in terms of range. You know what's the range of the anti-armor weapons that you're facing, and so now you're you're looking in the three to four kilometer band. You know, but most of most of Western Germany um, has enough has enough relief, has enough vegetation, has enough villages that usually that's what you're going to use to to decide and 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 uh, decide what your interval is is between the guys in front and the guys following. So if you have light light reconnaissance, uh, meaning it doesn't have anti-armor capability, right? Mm-hmm. Then um, then what you probably want to do is be as stealthy as you can, right? And, right. And, get, and get them to a place where they can observe pieces of the battlefield, right? And so in then, this scenario, that's largely going to be the fists that we've got? The M981 uh, Fist V is our forward observer because I think uh, everything else, I don't think we have everything else, all of our other recon is a Bradley. So it's going to have anti armor capability. Right. Your your cavalry is going to, is, is what you would call a heavy recon. It, it right. has the capability to actually fight if it comes in contact. Uh, so, Jeff, if you don't mind me interjecting here, yeah, um, yeah. when I first uh, came to you about this idea for uh, a recon series, I kind of came in with um, the sort of the old patent quote of we'll drive down that road till you get blown up. And and you pointed out to me that that's a, a pretty bad attitude to take, that these recon troops are pretty specialized, well-trained men. You, you don't want to waste them that way. Right. Right. And you, you pointed out the interesting facts also that. You know, flashpoint campaigns is a narrow tactical slice, and that um, a lot of the reconnaissance has actually already been done, and that um, it's really tied up in those intelligence briefings that we were looking at earlier. Yeah, we try to give you, uh, we try to give the players a, a full intelligence preparation of the battlefield package. You know, so you don't know precisely, you know, where exactly every every enemy unit is but at, at the beginning. You still have to, you still have to, your guys have to spot them, right? But you have an idea, a really good idea of where they're at and what direction they're coming, and and so you can take advantage of that, right? So, so for example, we we know that we have a a large armored force, um, like a mixture of motorized rifle and tanks, that are basically up in the northeast corner, and they're basically heading west or maybe a little bit southwest. All right. So, what do you do with your recon? You know, and and if you can get them into a place where they can see them approach, and uh, and and you have them hidden away in in high cover, high concealment, you have them set to hide their vehicles, then they can they're in a position to, you know, let you know where you know where their main body is and what direction it's going and what the composition is, and and you know target acquisition for artillery and all that kind of stuff. If you're doing something where, like, you're okay, I need to go, I need to go find the enemy, and I expect it, you know, I'm going to be looking for their frontline troops. Then, 
the answer to, of what to use to do that is your own frontline troops. And, and that's what we call uh, uh, move to contact, uh, advance to contact. The Soviet doctrine was uh, a little more structured as to how that works, but basically everybody pretty much does it the same way. You you take one of your subordinate elements and you push it out front, and you and and that 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 subordinate element that's pushed out front takes one of its subordinates and pushes out a little bit further, and and you probably take it down as far as maybe platoon level. And then that way, you know, you make contact with the regiment with a platoon. Uh, they're survivable because they're in fighting platforms, and you're not, you don't end up being uh, decisively engaged right at first contact. So I've, while you guys are talking, Jeff could use more volume. Okay, I can All right. fix that. There we go. That's hopefully better. Let me know if it's not. Um, let's see. Am I loud enough now? Yeah, and I just turned turned you up in particular as well. Okay. So that should help resolve things. Um, okay, so while you guys were talking here, I kind of set things up so that we've got our reconnaissance Bradleys on our right flank here are able to uh, move out ahead. Uh, whoops, did I just drag someone that's not supposed to be here? Yes, this one. Really bad at dragging instead of clicking today, it seems. Um, and then we'll have a tank company move up behind them. Um, but our objective here is not to drag all of the Russians south onto this lone uh, detachment. Um, and we want them to come into our prepared positions here. Um, so kind of, uh, looking at that a bit more here with that in mind, Jeff, do you want to outline, um, so I did, uh, previously also, I'm going to just reiterate, um, I set our, all of our reconnaissance units to only engage once they have gotten engaged because as you were saying right like we it's really hard to get unstuck once you've gotten uh made uh aggressive contact with the enemy so i've set all of the reconnaissance to only shoot back um thought i said it uh, did i set it oh okay they're currently doing holding fire until taking so let's say I want to do the default is going to be hold until fired upon. And we're going to prefer concealment. And we're going to apply this to all units of the same type. So these Bradleys, if we're just trying to get kind of an overwatching position, they don't necessarily need to get super far ahead, right? Right. We want, what, maybe a kilometer, give a little more visibility to the... And check it with a line of sight tool. Right, so um, I have... I mean, you, you, you know, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta consider it like, okay, so where, where do you wanna be able to see? Right. And you don't have to have continuous if you're just putting those guys up to to watch the parade of Soviet vehicles go by, so you understand and get a get a read on their scheme of maneuver, right? Mm -hmm. Then, uh, um, like you say, you just need to go far forward, forward far enough to observe the the interesting pieces of terrain. Yeah. So interesting pieces of terrain here. Uh, they probably won't be as far south as this bridge at bad bull but this bridge at uh was that r s z g e i don't even know how to pronounce that <laughs> um so whatever this these two bridges here this is probably going to be a hot spot for the russians i imagine this bridge and the two roads coming out of it so i think if we can kind of 
get visibility on here so I can with my unit selected I can shift click a hex and then I'll also want to turn on the line of sight and I also like yeah. to have on the ranges tool what also might be helpful is to zoom out a bit and then hit the Maku overlay so you get an idea of what ah, the, yes. maneuver, the maneuver corridors are uh, that is in terrain overlay. So Maku here is modified combat obstacle overlay. You can also bring it up with the shortcut control M. And so this is kind of basically a terrain overlay, right? So yeah. the, and, and the what solid it... faded blue here is showing our deployment zone, but then the hatch well, that, red that, is... Yeah, all that hatch terrain. red, all that hatch red is slow go terrain. And then the, the red hex sides are impassable. Right. Okay. And so go ahead and close the subunit inspector there in the upper left. Yeah, close that guy. So what what you can start to see is, you know, and of course they follow the road beds and they kind of run along next to rivers and stuff, but you can start to see, you know, where the choke points are and 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 uh you can predict you know what direction the 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 Warsaw Pact forces are going to are going to be traveling, and where, what what the pieces of terrain are they're going to use to move west, okay? And so right around in there is is you know you it, there's uh, a wide corridor that's easy to shovel a battalion through, okay? And and then from there it goes due west to where the the improved positions are. Sure. So you've got yeah, a couple, you've got you've got a couple of maneuver corridors that run from the northeast to the south southwest over over near where your your defense is going to be. Right. And then you've got another one that's further south that just goes it really opens up. Yeah, we definitely want to deny them uh, this road here, which is the A eight. That makes sense. The Autobahn would be a big road. Mm -hmm. um, and Luke Ford is helping me out with the pronunciation on this bridge, on this town. It's uh, Betz Can Read. Betz Can Read. Hopefully, I got that right. Um, so. Yeah, Betz Can Read. Uh, so I think uh, if I bring up our LOS and ranges here again, uh, we probably want our uh, Bradley maybe here-ish. That's not going to see as far as bets can read, but we'll get good visibility on the, well, we'll get some visibility on the road coming south as well as uh, any visibility, good, decent visibility <laughs> on any units moving in directly at the Bradley. So mm -hmm. we'll have him uh maybe do a move deliberate up to that position now as a reconnaissance unit he wants to be able to move back quite quickly so we probably want a screen rather than a hold order here right or would a hold well, so that they kind of try and make themselves invisible be better i would i would do a hold for a couple of reasons one is it's more i mean you, if you're planning on them observing for a long period of time right okay you know it the you think of screen as being a short halt Okay. Sure. And you want to be able to move out really quick, and you expect to move out like okay, the next 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 turn, right? But I think what okay. you what you're you you you're talking about making an observation post, basically. So, sure. you know, what you want to do is have those guys go in into hold right there. It also um, the, it it also makes them harder to spot, right? Mm -hmm. They're they're better hidden. Okay. So again, that that also goes to survivability. If they can't be seen, then you know when the sun comes up. So that's, that's the other thing to consider is that as you're moving right now, it's it's the middle of the night, and, and right. you have that you have that advantage of of being able to see further than the enemy can, and so it's definitely a a, a bump to your survivability as you get into into place. You you have a good chance of getting into places unobserved, and then get them in hold, hide the vehicles, and then. Um, then they're in really great shape to 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 just watch you know like i said watch the parade and call artillery as they drive by okay so i feel like this is 
a pretty powerful position to put our next Bradley in where we've got really astounding visibility to the surrounding area and pretty good concealment uh, in this hex as well to help them stay hidden. Decent cover, um, which is always nice to have. It, the now, other thing, the other thing that's that, that you're doing that's really good is you're not putting them astride the maneuver corridor so that they get just because of where the Warsaw Pack's going to be driving to try and get to their objective, they're not going to drive over on top of your guys. And, yes. and it's really it's really tempting sometimes to say, I'm going to block somebody, you know, and do that by going right astride where where they're going to be moving, which means that eventually you're going to have sub-kilometer engagements. And then and then that that starts to turn into a really even fight between both 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 sides. And just to give an example of that, um, so putting in a stride, since it, we're predicting that the enemy might come down this road here and along here to maybe push for the Autobahn, um, I, we would not want to put our recon in this hex, which would have at least as good a visibility, has yeah. some of the same terrain features in terms of really good concealment and decent cover for them, but is directly in that path that we expect the enemy to advance along. Right. Um, now, yeah, those, those guys are good busted if you put them that far forward, I think. Yeah, which would be particularly painful since this particular section is the section with the platoon commander in it, so we would be decapitating the uh, HQ of the platoon. Um, now, the Bradleys, I believe have most of the sensor equipment for this uh unit, yeah that's right? that's the, that's the choice that's the that's the choice and in, in the nighttime you might want to have not hide your bradleys right so you got the sensors but and then as you get closer to dawn you might want to go you might want to hide them and to rely on your dismounts with their you know binoculars so this is where we would look at our intelligence report, and I think in the weather forecast it tells us daylight, uh, dawn starts at 3.08 in the morning. So that's where right before, you know, our last turn before it hits 3.08, we would tell these guys, hey, go hide the Bradleys. We would change that and, SOP, and, right? And especially because during that time frame of just just after sunrise and just after sunset as as things heat up and cool down um everything gets to be the same temperature and thermals don't work that good right you know so right now the 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 uh the ground is warmer than the the, the vehicles that are parked once they start driving around then of course the running gear engine engine decks heat up and whatnot uh, but mm -hmm. once you have them parked and cooled down they're they're actually cooler than the ground and when the sun comes up, it starts to warm the armor up. And then for a period of about a half hour, 45 minutes or so, it's going to be about the same temperature as the ground and you don't see them anymore. And then, sure. then it soaks up more, more sun, more, more heat from the sun. And now it becomes warmer than the ground. You start seeing them again. So it's like about, you know, um, there, there's a, we call it, we call it, we call it the inversion time when, when the, the, the relative temperature of the vehicles the targets changes relative to the ground. And it's about a half hour uh, or so, uh, both at dusk and dawn. So, and, uh, and so you might as well go hide them because at least during that time frame, They're not gonna do much, especially because we yeah. specifically set it to uh, don't engage unless you're shot at. Right. So you're not gonna use those tow missiles. You're not gonna use the nice um, 25 millimeter Bushmaster. Yeah. That's not right, yeah? It, yeah, it is. Okay, uh, you know you're not going to use the weapon systems on the Bradley, so you might as well keep it hidden behind a building, bush, whatever. Right. Right. Uh, so as far as actually implementing that in the game, what you'll do is, when it gets to three o'clock in the morning, you'll change this carriers when empty instead of supports passengers, you'll change it to hide nearby. They'll go hide, and the infant the you know, a couple of dismounts out of each of those Bradleys will continue doing their spotting work. Um, and they have a profile size of one, so they're really hard to spot, especially in those prepared positions that they'll have had some, hopefully some time to get into. 
Now, I'm not as sure about where might be a good position for these guys. Possibly up on this hill. That seems pretty powerful. Um, it does have some dead zones in their spotting, which is unfortunate. But it will let them spot pretty far out. And the other advantage to being on a hill, of course, is if they're forced to withdraw, as soon as they get out of that hex, they're concealed by the hill itself. So it's pretty hard to spot them. And hopefully that is uh, before the Russians try and move south onto the Autobahn itself. So they should be relatively safe. So we'll put them there with the hold order. So, Jeff, um, for somebody that um, is new to Flashpoint campaigns, uh, something that this does very differently than a lot of other strategy games is um, the uh, Oda loop and how you only have a, um, you know, it's a fixed amount of time that you can't give orders. You need to wait for your turn to finish before you can actually give orders again. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to these recon units, I've noticed uh, in my play uh, that there's a real crucial element to spacing um, for your recon units to really be forward and be that tripwire so that you can actually react in time because everything in modern mechanized warfare is a fast paced uh, warfare, but everything takes longer than you think. Uh, dug in troops take a long time to, you know, get back into their tracks and get moving again. Uh, by the time that you detect and attack, you might not be able to react in time unless you have that really nice tripwire. So I'm wondering if you could kind of, you know, comment on that, elaborate on that a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely. And, and what you're really talking about is, is more the, of the security, uh, uh, function that that uh, reconnaissance forces often, and even line even line units will do this too. This depends on what you have available, and what you need, and so that 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 task is what we call a screen, right? Not not to be confused with the screen order, right? But it's it's an activity, and, and basically, like you say, it's 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 an early warning tripwire, and so you've got to have that that warning has to come early enough that one you're you're going to have time to get the orders out, and two there's time for the orders to be executed. Okay, so, you know, that once once those, once those once your early warning guys see something, right, and you know, oh, okay, yeah, they, they are gonna use the northern route, for example. So, you have, you, have to, you have to assume the worst cases, you know, you're looking at, you know, in this case, I think they're coming up, they'll start at, a, what is that, 25 minutes? Uh, we're at 28 minutes is our minutes. loop right now. The Russians, minutes. by contrast, have a very long 64 minutes. Okay, so you know, so you you, you right right away, there's a half an hour. At worst case, between they see something and the staff and commander can react, i.e., you can give orders. And then there's like how much time it takes, whatever your orders are, uh, for for the, those orders to to propagate down to the units that you want to. You want to do something with to respond to this new threat and then there's the travel time if you have to reposition people right and so you know it's it, and it can be challenging you're like how do i get enough time right and and so you may have it may it may drive your planning like oh you know i, I may have to go a little bit you know thinner over here because i don't have i won't have time to move an entire company you know, so what what can we do? What can I do about that? But absolutely, uh, it's very much time and space, and and that OODA loop, that command cycle, is not symmetrical as you can see. So the Americans here are going to be giving orders roughly at double the rate that twice as often as 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 the Soviets do, and this is going to change as the battle progresses. It's going to change due to fatigue. It's going to change due to uh, headquarters casualties. Uh, uh, throughout the force, and um, and so that that's gonna that's gonna shift around, and you have to keep an eye on that so that you understand, um, you know, you you set up a you set up a, a tripwire early warning tripwire with with like you know a scout platoon, and and they're watching they're watching a flank, and if your command cycle goes from thirty minutes to forty five minutes. Well, now you have to start thinking about: Do I? It, it, are those guys still in the right position to give me enough enough time with their warning, or I got to push them out further? 
So if you were to play, say, as a Soviet uh, faction, right, or a Warsaw Pact faction, and you have that really long Oda loop, um, it becomes crucial then for one to really leverage those recon assets so you do have that extra warning. But then also um, it um, becomes a burden on the player to really anticipate things rather than just react to them. Um, seems to be kind of the, the the way you would try to get around that. I, yeah, it it's it. And, um, you know, when you have long, you have a long command cycle and you're attacking, you know, it, it very much drives you to making making uh, decisions of what and committing to decisions a lot earlier, like even before you make contact. Uh, it, it's just the, the the disadvantage of when you make contact, you know, I'm going to I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do when I make contact, you know, uh, and and kind of. Um, I won't say make it up as you go along, but certainly decide as you go along. And that's becomes very difficult. You know, you know what you got to do and you can't do it fast enough. You know, and that's a real problem in real life. You know, you can be, you know, a division headquarters, walk, you know, pushing icons on the map and go, oh man, if they would, if we could just do this and you can't, you just can't make it happen. I was, um, Wondering for the scenario, there's a lot of American cavalry units on the field right now. And you mentioned, you know, there's heavy you know, recon units, ones that have some real teeth to them. And, and American cavalry definitely seems to be that way. Does any other faction in the game, NATO or Pact, really feature that, that, that dedicated heavy recon force like the Americans not, do? Not in, not, in, not in great numbers. I mean, what you'll see is with the, with the Soviets, you'll see at the regimental level and the division level, there's, uh, it's a mixture. It's small. Right, so you get a company, you know, a uh, a uh, reconnaissance company, and they'll typically be a company headquarters, and then two platoons that are in, in wheeled vehicles, you know, uh, BRDM scout cars, very lightly armored, heavy machine gun, and then one platoon of either infantry fighting vehicles or tanks, depending upon, you know, whether you're in a tank division or or a motorized rifle division. What those what now the 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 thought behind that and how they use them is um, the light reconnaissance is actually the thing that they're going to be probing with and if they come across an outpost you know like a platoon sized element or something like that or 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 maybe even a section um then you, you would use the, the platoon leader or the company commander would use that heavy platoon the fighting vehicle type to to take that out right but that just doesn't have enough mass to do the kinds of things that cavalry does and and the American cavalry is 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 out there. Um, one of their main missions is to uh, provide cover while forces roll out of out of their barracks and get to their general defense plant positions. So it's it's very much a, a, a time buying thing. And then at the core level, especially, the the other thing for the for the cavalry is uh, the plan was at some point during the war, like say at around day five or so, when you get done dealing with the very first, the first echelon armies, well, the Corps commander wants to know where is the second echelon at, right? And, and, the, and the sensor assets at the disposal of the Corps commander don't reach deep enough into the battlefield. So then that's where you start to, you know, read, read about plans to like, like attacking across the inner German border. And it's not really a counterattack. What it is, it's an attack through remnants in order to try to discover the location of the lead elements of the second echelon. And then once once that's once that targeting information is available, then then you know joint fires and whatnot can start working on disrupting uh, the cadence of introducing more combat power in into the into the into, into the theater. You know, because it was very much believed even at, even back in the 70s that you know, at least for the Americans, the, the brigades could handle uh, could handle the fight continuously for you know the weeks it would take, as long as you could control the pace that enemy units got got jammed in your down your throat, and so that that was and that that was part of the reason for air land battle was was the notion was the, the recognition that the the ground forces didn't have the the assets to do all that stuff it needed air assets as well. And it was about controlling the pace of of um, follow-on Soviet units coming into the battle. You get the if, if if you're still fighting the first echelon, 
and the second echelon shows up, that's game over. That's basically, uh, and so we're trying to prevent that. Yeah, I think it's worth pointing out too that even though the Soviets have a very large OODA loop here, um, they're, um, you know, if you've played this game, you, you'll know that experience that as soon as you see a first Soviet unit, they come on you quickly. They they practice their battle oh, drills. Yeah. They can they can <laughs> deploy very quickly. Yeah, I, I'm i always impressed uh, at how quick they move, even in an assault order. Um, they're moving, what, a, like it's a kilometer in, you know, 10 minutes or whatever faster. It's and that's that's an assault order that's the slowest most cautious they're still able to take Not ground del that quickly del deliberate is the slowest oh is move deliberate the slowest not assault yeah. no assault's faster oh okay well that would be part of my confusion <laughs> so in that case i probably want to change um pretty much all of these orders uh to be assaults then um because we're not necessarily expecting. Oh, that no, please stay there. Uh, that is still trying to do a drag. I'm gonna turn off some of these UI layers. It just doesn't want to let me do that. Oh yes, that's probably what the problem was. So Jeff, we might be getting a little bit of our uh, ahead of ourselves right now, but um, let's say um, a force makes contact. It sort of develops the fight. It understands what it's up against and is, you know, in the process of of fighting an engagement. What do you do with your recon units then? Where where do you want to put them? Because obviously, you know, you mentioned for those cavalry units, there's very few dismounts there. You don't really want them to just start trading in like the general melee, you know. So so what do you do with them once that fight's really started? Well, I mean, re really. I don't even. I you make. I make that decision before I even you know make contact. You know what? What are the tasks that I want the different my different forces to use? And so, typically, what I'll want to do is use use, use my reconnaissance elements either uh, as an early warning, or put them in a place where they can confirm and deny what I think the enemy courses of action may be. All right. So, you know. So, for example. Um, are they going to approach along Audubon A8? Right, that's kind of a critical thing to know, right? Because because I may need to shift guys around that are west of the river, right? Depending upon where the weight of effort is, so I want to find out where the weight of effort is. And so what I really want to do is is with with uh, my reconnaissance effort, not necessarily just reconnaissance forces, but my reconnaissance effort is, you know, what are the maneuver corridors that are that are that are being used, and and how much. Of of weight is on each one, you know. Where's the main effort coming at, and uh, and also I just I I'll, I'll want to make sure that like there's a maneuver corridor way to the north northwest, you know. I want to make sure that there's somebody that that can tell me what's what's going on, and early enough like before you make contact, right? So um, because again, uh, understanding what course of action that your enemy is doing or which ones they're not doing a lot and if you if you can find that out early enough then um you know it gives you time to to reposition and and of course as part of your course of the and course of action planning you're going to say well if they come this way here's what i want to do if they come that, that way here's what i want to do and so you 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 have a, a a good feel for which units you're going to do uh, you're going to reposition, for example, to to counter you know a threat on uh, this this avenue or that avenue, and so you can actually think in terms of like you know what's the criteria for giving that order, and what is the order that's going to happen? Well, you know, this company is going to set up in the southeast edge of this town over here. Okay, so what's the trigger point? You know, and, and it may be you, you start to think in terms of like, oh, well, if I see a tank company you know, west of this river on this road, then that means they're coming down that valley and I got to get my guys over there. 
and so you're kind of leaning forward in the saddle right looking for those looking for those indicators and then you've already figured out what what the decision is you just have to you just have to uh, give the order if you're uh if you're doing an attack and you have a significant movement right so like put yourself in this in this case put yourself in the shoes shoes of the soviets right so you've got many kilometers to move before you expect you know probably to make significant contact and and so you're going to have an extended flank so you need to have that that trip wire and it has to move it has to keep pace with the main body as it as it moves you know across the map and it it can be pretty tricky and be, you know uh to make sure that they're far enough away from the main body and that the main body doesn't get ahead of them right so you've got that continuous uh early warning that's keeping pace with your main body as it moves forward yeah i've i've noticed definitely since uh, we've talked about this before the use of scouts too to just watch say a quarter that you need to transit that you know is safe but having them stay there watching it making sure it remains safe so you can if you need to quickly move hasty through it in in game terms you know the mm -hmm. just the value of that Shout out to fists apparently being uh, amphibious. I didn't realize they were amphibious enough to cross the Makar. Sorry, I <laughs> got a little distracted by that. Um, so before I uh, continue just going on and deploying the rest of my stuff, um, how would you evaluate this this plan of deployment here of putting our the recon elements generally well i guess between a kilometer and a half and just even 500 meters I think, out that, ahead. I think that looks good i mean what you're doing is you're setting up surveillance uh, of that maneuver corridor that goes along along a8 and you'll get an early read that somebody is going down to use that autobahn so that's really i think that's good thank you uh beegs and jam for the raid uh to all of the people who have uh just joined the channel we are going over and looking specifically at uh, reconnaissance and scouting within flashpoint campaign southern storm but really just kind of general uh common you know what is actually used in the real world as well and how that relates into the game um and as a slightly more specific to this scenario we have lots of russians up in the northeast here and they're going to kind of move through uh, we have some germans who have prepared some positions for us to help defend and we have lots of americans including a number of helicopters to stop the russian advance here uh, the time starts at literally o dark hundred so in the middle of the night um, and we'll probably see contact sometime around dawn, I'm guessing. Uh, yeah, which I suppose I, technically I means we'll be fighting with the sun in our eyes a little bit. It is uh, July, so a bit of a northern sun. Um, and we are facing east here, so that's not ideal. But um, certainly if they get to us before dawn, that's not going to go well for them. So we have a lot of anti-tank assets here. And these are, these are what? Like guys on motorcycles with some... Oh, they're not anti-tank. They are grenade launchers, it looks like. 20 millimeter. It's an auto cannon. Okay. I am not familiar with this weapon. What exactly is this thing? Is this like towed by an ATV or do they have a very small 20 millimeter with a bunch of ammo strapped to the side of an ATV or what's going on with this thing? I don't know. Let me look that up real quick. Um, certainly for armor piercing uh, is enough to go through uh, any of the motorized um, assets that the Russians have. It's not going to do anything to a tank. 
um, but it's enough to go through, say, a BTR uh, just fine. Um, maybe not out to that three kilometer range. Um, but when you've got six of these in each of these units, um, that's not bad. <laughs> That's a pretty decent uh, firepower, pretty decent amount of firepower. So I wonder, um, I maybe set this to short range to kind of reinforce our ambush aspect of these things. They don't have a whole lot of firepower uh, after all. Um, and I'm not going to be doing a whole lot of movement, so I'm not going to bother setting up anything else. If Hang I... on a second. Go, go, back to the, go back to the unit dashboard on that. That, that kind of unit. Uh, that's a Kraka ATV twenty millimeter. Okay, go go, scroll that, scroll down to the bottom of that. Okay, and weapon. They've got an RH two hundred two, which is a twenty millimeter auto cannon. Yeah, it's an air defense limited. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Looking at uh, Google Images, that thing is just an ATV with sort of a flat bed for an auto cannon on it. Okay, nice, nice. So it is at least the 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 auto cannons on the back on a on a pivot. Yeah, uh, it's, so... it's more of an air defense weapon. I mean that. I mean it, it's got a splinter shield on the front, but I mean, Kraka really... is an early ATV vehicle, like an open jeep or buggy. Okay, good stuff. Yeah, a little bit bigger than the U.S. Mule. Yeah. So I'm wondering if I do apply to all units of the same type here. Um, it's grabbed some HQs, but that's. Oh, did I actually grab the HQ unit from that? I'm honestly kind of okay with it. Uh, issuing short range to all the HQs. I, but I think yes, I did grab the HQ unit to try and issue this order to. So let's, I'll go ahead and set that, but let's maybe not try doing that again without necessarily grabbing an HQ unit. Um, and so we're going to set this to a short range. Uh, preferred standoff will be zero. Um, actually, as lightweight as these things are, we probably don't necessarily, and they probably have pretty good mobility being ATV. So a preferred standoff of one hex is probably okay. They don't necessarily want to share space with the enemy. So we'll uh, apply that. Oop, no, I want this. What all is that going to grab? Okay, the only other stuff that's going to grab is our dedicated anti-tank, which uh, I think for right now, leaving them on also short range is probably okay. We're gonna be having a lot of short range engagements and the tow has a pretty long range, 3750. So a third of that is still more than a kilometer. So that's like three-ish hexes. That should be okay. And if we need to change the range on our, these are 901, yeah, 901s, um, we can do that. So um, where do we want to set these up? Kind of probably up in these entrenched positions. Um, if I set you here it's not not my favorite position but it's not the worst and so these bridges are knocked out um these bridges are also knocked out so i think uh the other one we really need to worry about here down here okay now 
what is this unit? This is the command unit for those guys, I guess. Um, really just here to provide command radius. We're just going to kind of hide them in the back. Um, move this guy over to here and then I'll, oh, okay. Yeah. See, that's why I, we look under that tile because that would have been a bad tile to hide them in. So, I noticed you're um, moving around a lot of headquarters units, and this might be another uh, chance to get back on the recon topic. Um, I'm sure if someone's played this game a lot, they've noticed before they have a recon unit set up. Um, they don't get detected, and the Soviets maybe advance over their position, and then they start to spot some very juicy rear line stuff. They start to spot start to spot artillery or uh, observation vehicles or or headquarters units. And I, I was wondering, Jeff, if you could comment on. Um, uh, reconnaissance units and their sort of value in getting behind like the front tactical lines yeah, and, yeah. and going after squishies. That's well, it's not just that. I mean, um, you know, there's, there's really great stuff that's back there. Um, that's not very well protected and kind of act, act as like force multipliers for, for your enemy. So yeah, if you can, uh, put a hit, put hits on, on, on a headquarters or, or even destroy it, which is great. Um, and, and of course, you know, you start, you start whittling down their fire support batteries. To, once you get them down to like two tubes, they're they're pretty ineffective, right? So those those are always great things, great great things to be able to do. So if the terrain is conducive to it, I will like definitely spend the time to infiltrate somebody back to where they can look at to get behind the enemy front line guys, and they're starting to look at at what's going on in the rear, which would include. Like uh, I may, I want to may want to do that because I want to know where is his reserve, and when when does he commit it, and where is he committing it to? Those are those are very helpful things as well. But a lot of times you just need to have the right terrain to be able to do that, right? If it's if it's miles of cultivated wheat fields, it's hard to do, you know. But if but in, in on a map like this where you've got lots of woods, and you've got lots of elevation, it's very possible to get somebody into a vantage point. And be patient, um, because they're moving, and eventually there's there's stuff in the back that's going to need to move forward. They're going to have to move their artillery so it can range uh, to the objective. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is just a personal observation, and it might be just anecdotal, but I've noticed that for a lot of scenarios, it seems like there's a lot more Soviet artillery that appears on map than NATO artillery. Is that just because the Soviets tend to have a lot of tubes, so they just tend to be more often on map, or do they actually have them a lot for closer to the front than, say, how NATO employs them? Well, um, I, I guess the, the first thing to, is, it to recognize is, like, the West does fire and maneuver, so... Ma Fire supports maneuver, and um, the the Soviet way of thinking is fire creates the opportunity for maneuver. And so, when when the the Soviets would say we're going to we're going to break in over here, they would really pile on a lot of artillery, and they started they started really getting that down, uh, very executing that very well towards towards the the last last couple of years of World War II, you know, they started pushing, pushing, pushing the Germans back west, back home. And so that, that's part of it. Um, that's, it's the number of tubes, it's getting it forward and getting all that ammunition forward. So they prefer not to keep moving it around, you know, to a certain extent. Yes, you need, you need to do survivability moves. But I mean, it's just, you know, you're, you're, when you're attacking and you're using lots of artillery, that's a lot of tonnage of ordnance you got to keep pushing forward. And so, um, and, and, and when you're attacking, you know, like if, if things are off map, then a lot of systems can't range the whole map. And so, yes, they're going to have that, that artillery forward. And, you know, you've got an artillery battalion per regiment that's organic, and then the division may have may have some other assets, you know, like like mis uh, rocket batteries and whatnot. And, and so, you know, part of it is the narrative that you're telling the story, you're telling with the scenario, and that that kind of that kind of leads you into, you know, apart from play balance, uh, 
you know, getting getting the right amount of artillery, and then you know, if it's off map, you can't move it. And so if if it can't range the entire map, you know, then it's kind of like, oh, okay, well, you get this for the first part of your operation before you're even in contact, and then you make contact, and you're out of range of your off map artillery. So that, that that's kind of like, oh, that's not fun. So yeah, that's why you see a lot more artillery on map, and, and it's mostly because the you know the, the the big story is the west attacks the east attacks the west and so that kind of gives you a dynamic of you know where on the map and what direction and how far and it and it drives you to say well I got to put this artillery on the map otherwise they'll, they they won't be they won't be useful to the, to the soviets and of course one of the nice things that we'll have coming up here is a lot of the stuff going forward we're adding in um some better support for larger maps too so not as many assets will necessarily have to be off map assets more of the assets can be on the map where it can be more directly controlled so do you guys think this northernmost approach here is one that we need to set up a defense around. I'm inclined to go with yes. Well, you certainly need to detect if there's any anything coming down that that, that northern route. Uh, this uh, the stream and the video that we're releasing is dedicated to reconnaissance, so this might be a yeah. good example of a tripwire and then a general reserve that can plug that gap if they need to. Okay. So I think our reserve is probably going to be this cavalry coming in very soon. And we'll kind of leave the tripwire to, uh, I guess this is probably a company. One of the three companies out of this Falshermia year unit. Um, so this is... Well, think about this. If they're going to come that way, you know, where 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 do you get where do you get your indicator from? Yeah. So probably. You know. So right now I've got uh, this fist is going to come come up to here, and should give me some early indicator. Um, How far can you see? He can see a couple of kilometers, not nearly as well as I would like. Uh, this is, I think, Hachdorf. I, I'm guessing at the pronunciation. But uh, yeah. Hachdorf there is kind of blocking us from being able to get real good visibility there. Um, unless I wanted to really extend the fist out to like here, where, okay, I can see further up the road, but as far as the fist trying that, to stay that, alive that, it's not very yeah, good see, that, that's a that that whole place is is really a problematic route yeah you know, how do you, you how do you get far enough forward to see it although you know this now you you, you look at at reconnaissance doctrine and it's like well it if the if the terrain is too slow to get there on foot you know or on wheels or on tracks that's when you really start thinking about using aircraft right so I think maybe what we do is we look at the fist is kind of here um, and we'll have this company in kind of a blocking position. I have no idea where I'm going to put his headquarters. Uh, I think we're just going to hide the headquarters here. And this headquarters can be... Uh, this is like back here even and then we'll kind of lean on our uh, helicopters here to provide uh, kind of some intelligence from these mountains where they should have lots of terrain that they can kind of hide in kind of play the peekaboo game okay so there's our falsham jaeger unit set up uh, our air defense that we don't have nearly as much as we'd like. Um, let's 
change all of them to hold orders real quick, and then we'll start dragging them around. I gotta step away for just a minute. So I'm gonna leave them on a medium engagement just because uh, they have so much trouble dealing with that they're not the level of efficacy as I would maybe prefer them to be. Which is funny, because when I play as Soviets, I feel like uh, one Steiner will absolutely murder all my Hinds. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those, like, it can definitely do damage. Like, between Stingers and Vulcans, give me Stinger missiles all day long. <laughs> but it's just, like, there's only so many. Um, and well actually i don't know that the enemy had so we're i don't feel like i have enough but at the same time this is actually one of those situations where according to our intelligence the russians don't actually have any air assets um this is actually kind of part of this scenario where we're where we set up into that Uh, so, you know, the enemy air assets have been kind of knocked out, so we don't actually need these stingers to do a lot this time, which is nice. So I'm going to kind of sprinkle them around, be a responsible adult to cover our artillery. And, um, speaking of, let's put our artillery out where it can be covered by that. There we go. Okay, so there's our artillery covered. Oop, I just dragged this. I don't know where this was. I'll just drag it up here. Okay, so uh, I think... Oh, these guys can actually start all the way up with the Fallschirmjägers. I like that. Okay, so I'm going to, in that case, uh, issue hold orders to them real quick. Uh, this is just a whoop. this is just a mortar unit, so we're gonna kind of put it up here, uh, maybe a little further forward in here. Okay, so that's your reserve, correct? Yeah, I think though we do have a lot of reconnaissance here. This is this is our other leg of reconnaissance. So we may push these Bradleys a little further forward if we can, uh, just to kind of serve as that tripwire for, ah, now I know the Russians are coming, maybe get some early artillery hits. Uh, so I'm gonna kind of push a couple of, I'll, we'll put one platoon up there. We'll put another platoon. Um, I'm going to put them here just so I can see them. Technically, I shouldn't because that'll just delay their them getting into position. The HQ can kind of be back here. And then, so I want to use uh, these two tank platoons that are with that cavalry. Um, I'm going to put them here where they can kind of be a QRF faster than maybe the rest of this stuff can get into position. I don't expect to need them to be the main QRF, but... Um, so these guys, we maybe do an assault up to like here? That should give them some pretty good fallback positions. And... And you, um, oh, don't like that. This, I do like this though. And we're not really trying to do any damage with these guys, though, you know, it is one of these, you know, the 
they can kind of reconnaissance in force. So if we get to the point where the Russian reserve is committed, um, they can maybe go on to do some awful things to the Russian headquarters and artillery units. Okay, maybe now these guys are going to have a bit harder time where they're really going to have to fall back and rely on the terrain to let them disengage. But they will serve as a good tripwire for us. So I'm noticing here for this map in particular, there's, you know, some very prominent ridge lines here, very heavily forested and, of course, a fairly large you know river on your flank. Um, yesterday, we just announced that um, Central Storm is is coming, and it's going to be set more in Central Germany, where it's starting to get you know a lot flatter up there. So I'm wondering, um, do do you still see uh, terrain features like this in Central Germany, or is it on the whole a lot more you know flat, open, longer sight lines, um, and not as broken up as this is? Because this looks very broken up here. This this is very very broken up, a lot of complex terrain. As you move as you move north, like you said, it flattens out until when you get when you get way up north, up near the you know up near the Baltic, up near Denmark, you know that whole area east to west, like all the way to Moscow, is pretty flat, right? Now, and so and so the the things that kind of partition the battlefield are built up areas, and uh, water features, not so much not so much elevation. Now, there are there are places where there's ridge lines, you know, and, and significant significant ridge lines. And and some forested areas, uh, but it's kind of like the further north you go, the the flatter it gets, and the more farm like it it becomes. But there's also a lot of build up areas. And this is a very interesting map to me. Um, it's really it's really a a, a big divide in in half. Uh, kind of like going right through the middle of it is you know significant elevation. That really starts to partition the map into into little little zones, and then that's further complicated by by the forested areas. And so, if you can get guys far enough forward, you know you can see when when those the Soviets commit to which uh, maneuver corridor. I was just thinking that that you could choose just to commit your whole force down one of those valleys and just decide I want to win that one. But then what happens if NATO forces have committed all of their anti-tank assets down that one alley? Well, you're you're in for a world of hurt. Yeah. And and the other thing is that, you know, there none of those maneuver I mean, when you get really close to Kirchheim, it opens up and you could, yeah, you could shove a division into Kirchheim from the southeast, you know, for about five or six kilometers. Now to get to that point, you have a lot of more narrower areas and you have a hard time pushing a lot of combat power at one time down down those down those uh those corridors and and so you know one of the things to to be thinking about was like well you know uh, using multiple corridors and then when you get to that area it's kind of the southeast of Kirchheim um where all those blue all those blue manu movement arrows are once you get down into there well if they all if they all meet up and then push on as a mass that 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 final drive onto the city you know that's that's significant. You know that's a, that's a significant threat. And and the key to the, the key to um, dealing with that is is identifying as early as you can which maneuver corridors are being used by what. And then you can see where does the maneuver corridor lead. And when you get like two two maneuver corridors that open end at the same open area, you know that's a that's a pretty high threat area there. Because then you, you're looking at, oh, you know, you could get a, you know, you might have to take a regiment. A regiment may may need to go down two different roads, right? Uh, but those roads join up, and then, you know, they're joining up at just about where you're going to begin your assault. So is it that bad? It, you know, it, you know from, from the attacker standpoint, is that's not that bad. I suppose with an ideal execution, it would be the, uh, the maximum of uh, march divided and then fight concentrated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
Because it's also worth pointing out that this game does model traffic jams. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and we'll see that once I hit start here. I've piled up a whole bunch of these things all in one hex. And they're, I mean, they've got some good roads here, but we're going to see them one after the other leaving. They're not going to all leave right at once. And then, and then the other thing that, that you'll see as as uh, battle unfolds, um, you shoot a bunch, you shoot a bunch of enemy in in a particular location, and you start piling up wrecks, and those wrecks consume, you know, traffic ability as well. Mm -hmm. And and you'll you'll eventually see where everything drives around that hex because there's too much junk in there. Um, question for me, actually, then, because um, I feel like I've noticed this in game, but it might just be anecdote. I might just be imagining it. Enough wrecks in a hex. Do they interrupt spotting? Because I feel like they have before the amount of smoke being generated. Yeah, um, it, it, yeah, it 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 does that. It it affects spotting. Well, good to know. And I wasn't just imagining it. Nope. <laughs> I actually do want these guys on two thirds range. I don't know. So, Jeff, would you recommend a short or a medium range for our infantry, uh, our U.S. infantry? I, I I tend to put everybody on max range. I mean, there's there's yeah. You know... Okay. I think just I because think of the limited anti-tank ammo, I'm probably going to go with a medium range. I really want to push the ambush aspect here. There, I mean, there's that. If you know, I mean, you may you may look at the range bands of different weapons, and if you if you're trying to get a a massive fire in a short period of time, then you may want to reduce the range on your longer range fires. Yeah, certainly and the that, tanks. I I need to while we're talking about that, I want to set them all of our tanks to be max range. Um, the other trade-off is, you know, every time you shoot, you advertise your location and that's inviting artillery fire. Yes. Right? And, and so you've got, you know, five minutes or so to, to get displaced out of there before you're going to re receive artillery. And of course, the first guy that shoots invites the most because there's all these tubes waiting to possibly, if they're moving. Right. They're <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and so, you know, you have a prepared defense you, and you may want to, to um, deny the opportunity for, for them to, to, to shoot artillery because you've been spotted shooting at long range. Mm -hmm. And certainly, uh, the Russians don't have as much artillery as they'd maybe like to have, but they have a lot more than none. So now I am honestly not sure where the right place to put um, all of this infantry and tanks is. Let's see. So I put these guys here. Yeah, I think just kind of having. Uh, I'm going to put this company, I think, into uh, Kerkheim here, uh, kind of fortifying things. But I think I probably want to hold most of them in reserve, I imagine. Because I don't want, we don't want to necessarily obligate all of our force before we know where the Russians are putting the bulk of their forces. So we're just going to kind of put these guys in good positions. Uh, I'm not going to worry about moving the counters around so that they can get there faster, because I think they'll get there fast enough. Um, well, I might move these infantry that are really far away from anything like a road. Uh... Um, a unit's response time on screen is substantially faster than hold, correct? Yes. What do you mean by response time? 
uh, to an order to um, asking yes, them to yes, move to a new yes, position. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, and I am. I have been telling these guys to uh, hold. I probably. I think I'm going to leave them on hold just because uh, I want to keep their visibility down. Um, I don't want them getting spotted uh, before I need them to start moving and engaging things. Um, oh, wait, but I do need to bring these guys. I do want to put this artillery maybe not on the road. HQ again, not on the road. Always a good idea to have your artillery and HQ not on the road where they're going to get spotted just by enemies advancing. Um, we will I believe we kind of hinted at it earlier, but yes, I think most of us have experienced in play at this point that putting your critical assets and, and you know rec units especially on the road where the line of advance is crossing is uh not a good idea it's a good recipe to get them all yeah. killed uh the infantry are a little bit slower to get moving so i think you do raise a good point if i want to have them whoop, uh screen in their positions the tanks they just kind of get up and go um, Whereas our mechanized forces, they need a little more time. Uh, I'm going to put these guys kind of up here. And because they're a little more visible, this company will do a hold position. Oop. Stay there, please. I'm being a little disorganized here just because I am trying to be cognizant of the time. I mean, so much of this game seems to be decided, you know, it's, it's decided in deployment because once oh, you're yeah, actually, yeah. once everything's on the ground, everything's very, I say this game has a very sticky feel to it. You need to, the central reserve makes sense with how response times work. It's really well modeled why a commander would keep as large a force as possible, maybe in in reserve, um, because once it's on the line, it's really out of his control and committed. You you really get that feeling when you play this uh, Flashpoint campaigns. Yeah, I would definitely <laughs> definitely have to concur with that sentiment. Um, so, oh, this is um, yeah, we'll put you there and you guys so this is a little bit more reconnaissance here uh, that we looked at earlier so I'm just kind of putting them out to serve as tripwires not on the road uh, just kind of adjacent to the road where we can see what might be moving along it hopefully get them into position before uh, the Russians can get there. Okay, so I'm going to bring up... Ah, so this is our FARP for our helicopters, which we can actually put really far forward, potentially. Um, here, I think. Maybe here. So that's really advantageous, being able to have that so far forward. Um, this is our brigade headquarters. Probably something that should be further back, but honestly, I want it to be where our um, air defense can keep it safe. So we've got a bunch of Kiowas, which can also be really far forward. So let's drag them up and kind of scattered around, and then we'll start issuing movement orders to our different helicopters. Um, the Apaches will probably get hunt orders just straight out of the gate. 
Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but if I remember right, the doctrine here is Kia was cooperating with the Apaches, right? So, like, aren't they supposed to be paired off or something along those lines? I believe. Yeah, that we don't. Is. We don't. We don't have a mechanic that actually makes has them cooperate. You yeah. know, so that you had kind of, you know, kind of run that yourself, as far as, and, and that's that's you know that's one way to do it is is you you know you make they call them pink teams, um. So you have, you have a, a reconnaissance bird or birds, reconnaissance section working with an attack section, and and the reconnaissance ones are doing a target acquisition and handing the targets over, um, to the Apaches. And I think so. I believe the Kiowas, sensor-wise, are not significantly more capable yeah, these are, than these the are, Apaches. These are the C model, they're not the Ds. Yeah, so, so they have, have, the, have the mass vision, sensor. optical. Yeah, we have a radar, but that's a radar warning receiver, so they don't have a radar. They have a receiver to know if they're getting radared. Um, but yeah, so like in terms of getting thermal sites, you need the Apaches for that. Um, so they're providing a little bit of better spotting, but mostly what they're giving you is a harder to spot in return platform. They're much stealthier. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm just going to have these things hunt like kind of far forward. And uh, yeah, so that's providing great visibility up there. Yeah, I no think it's worth... Go ahead. No, I was just going to say it's worth pointing out. I've, I've, I tend to play Soviets, and I have had tremendous difficulty shooting down Kiowas before. Their nimbleness is, um, if they're in the trees, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to actually put them down. Yeah, and this terrain is spot on for what we would want for these helicopters, with uh, lots of these valleys that they can kind of duck in and out of. Um. And, and yeah, like you were saying, you know, trees to kind of block line of sight. Um, so they're going to be pretty hard pressed with the amount of defenses that are available. But I think um, the terrain is pretty favorable to them. So that's going to be a massive advantage. And we can kind of use these to get an idea of what the Russians are going to be up to before uh, things get too stuck in. And I'm kind of um, making massive advantage of the incredible amount of mobility that helicopters give in the game because of how quickly helicopters move relative to just anything else, right? Um, you know, and Abrams is fast at, what, 60-ish kilometers an hour? Is that about right, Jeff? Yeah, so it's like 60, 70, something like that. Yeah, so, you know, they can get up to kind of low highway speeds, and that's fast for a main battle tank. Um, you don't have a whole lot going a whole lot faster than them. And the helicopters are just, like, triple, quadruple that speed. So... It's, uh, they're almost, the turn you order them to be somewhere, they are there. It's really nice. Um, so we can kind of move these up rather aggressively, uh, lean on that hunt order to let them do scary things without being in too much danger. And... Uh, reposition them before they're uh, really in a dangerous position themselves. Honestly, having uh, helicopters is an incredible advantage, uh, especially if the enemy doesn't. It's I don't think you could state that advantage enough. Whoops, that is 
Uh, not the order type that should be. That should be a hunt, not a move hasty. So we're so almost... this... Go ahead. So do the Soviets have any kind of helicopter reconnaissance assets like this? Because this is a lot of Kiowas. Like, this is a heck of a lot of eyes in the sky. <laughs> yeah, we've got a lot of Kiowas. We've got a lot of Apaches. And according to our intelligence report, they don't have any helicopters. They don't have any aircraft, any fixed-wing aircraft. Um, so, yeah, in that regard, uh, the Americans and NATO at large are well positioned to ambush the Russians in this encounter, which is what this is intended to do. Um, that's kind of the where this scenario goes, really, is um, the first three scenarios in this campaign are going and, you know, ah, the Russians have chosen to attack first and we're really uh, caught flat footed by this and trying to recover. And now this is, ah, now we're ready to stop them. We're ready to ambush them as they try and advance one more step. And I imagine scenario five is really kind of counterattacking, but this is kind of the point where the tides flip back to uh, NATO having an advantage again in the campaign. So uh, at long last, we are ready to see how our reconnaissance plays out. I am going to um, change our replay speed just so we can see things because uh, we're running low on time here. So I'm going to kind of pick up the pace that the game will play at here. Um, there we go. And let's hit start, see how we do. Ah, so right away I'm noticing we've got Enemy artillery falling on us, we've got smoke coming down, and they are deployed a little further ahead than we were necessarily expecting them to be. Uh, this should really only have a significant impact on our helicopters, but hopefully with all those Apaches, they'll be able to kind of take the teeth uh, and a lot of the reconnaissance out of the enemy um, just right out of the gate here. Ooh, but we do lose to some pretty long-ranged enemy air defense here, just right out of the gate, where I was kind of hoping they wouldn't be at all. Um, yeah, getting pretty roughed up there. Oh, and that's our headquarters. Uh, maybe shouldn't have had that one moving forward, but we'll see how that pays out. And this is, yeah, here we go. Lots of Russians here. This is many large units. Um, Apache's getting some uh, fire of their own. Got a tank company down there in the south. Yeah, did see some, we got some tanks here. Some more tanks here. This, uh, given that this is only four subunits, we did get some kills here, but this is probably the headquarters for a larger unit, I'm guessing. Yeah, here's lots of tanks here. This Kia was probably not long for this world, I imagine, flying over that much. There's got to be something that's going to be air defense related in this to take a shot at him. Maybe not, though. I'm going to be really impressed if there's no... Ah, there we go. I think that might actually just be the uh, pencil guns on the T-72s. Yeah, T-72s taking some shots at him as he flies just a little too close. There's some more air defense trying to take out the Kiowas. I'd rather the air defense shoot at the Kiowas than the uh, Apaches. So Apaches... You, didn't put, you didn't put any of your artillery on FSCC control? Oh, did I not? They are all in on call, but they might be in the wrong on calls. Because you are right. We've gotten four minutes in. Um, who are you on call to? You are. Ah. Where is it? Let's see. Fires and supply and reload. Direct support. All requesting units. Yeah, it looks like they should be okay. Looks like the default is all requesting units. So I think probably our fire support just hasn't had time to 
Um, yeah, we we do have one uh, fire mission. Oh, we're only four out. minutes. We're only four minutes in. Yeah, okay. we're we're just hitting the beginning here. So, uh, we've got yeah one fire mission here. Okay. Okay. Ah, uh, so we get our uh, cavalry reconnaissance. Um, what does that look like back there to you? Yeah, that right there. This. Yeah. Um, honestly, this could be anything at this point. Uh, I'd have to pause to get the tool tips up, but uh, you, you don't. You don't need it to. It could be headquarters stuff and well, artillery. It's our. It would probably artillery. Looking at the unit count and the location on the battlefield in re relation to the front enemy front line troops. Yeah. Right. So that that's an artillery report. Yeah. Yeah, so if we see, yeah, so definitely uh, as once our Bradleys get up into position, if they can kind of confirm what some of these are, if we see that this is uh, artillery, then yeah, we'll probably push forward with our Abrams here. Because we've got, um, I believe it's... Can your artillery range that far? Uh, probably, I would It's probably nearish the edge of their range, but I would guess, I would hazard a guess the answer to that question is yes. Yeah, I think they may be, yeah. I mean, we do have uh, this unit of mortars. Mortars, not necessarily the most effective at the task, but um, better than nothing. Oh, we only got like a 6,700 meter range though, too. Yeah, the, the, the mortars are, uh, that is near the edge of the range for where they're at. Um, because I was expecting the Russians to be <laughs> like 10, 20 kilometers further east than they're, where they're at. Uh, just by the just by the, the equipment count, and it kind of tells you that that it's probably they're probably got to be a little bit west of of yeah. where that where the icon, the center of mass icon, is in the threat brief. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, there we go. Now we're getting some more of those artillery calls in. There we go. Okay. We have lost a number of helicopters. Oh, and I just noticed that we did. We're going to get some uh, support aircraft coming in in reserve. Probably won't get to that uh, in this stream, but um, it does come in on this summer, so that's nice. There we go. So helicopters are uh, taking some losses, but they're also knocking out a number of enemy anti-tank. I think that was them taking a fight out of Sam's here, which is nice. There, yeah, there's three more tanks dead. I love it. And there's most of that unit dead. Are we going to get the last unit? Last subunit there? No, we didn't. So I'm really curious to see, so this recon, uh, I was expecting to just kind of be a tripwire, but they're going to end up kind of assaulting into the enemy, but they are going to be doing it from the flank. So um, fortunately, they've got some low ground they can kind of hide behind once they start taking fire. So we'll see where that kind of puts things. I am very happy we've got all this artillery to hit these spaces here. Unfortunately, I don't Again, our reconnaissance here, pushing forward to trying to give me that early uh, tripwire is going to end up running into the teeth of the enemy. Uh, on the other hand, we might actually, it looks like, knock out this HQ unit with them. If that HQ unit is foolish enough to open fire on them. Long range Sam did knock out one of the Apaches, but given back. At least it's good, knocking out, it looks like the enemy, probably Strellas. Well, I don't know, that was kind of long range, so it might be like Tunguskus or something. Yeah, you didn't expect the Soviets this far forward, but it also looks like you're catching a lot of those units still on the road in uh, in road march, so you, you're doing yeah. some damage. Yeah, and that hunt order letting them just naturally fall back without me having to intervene. Uh, really helping out here. And in a few cases, uh, they're just withdrawing naturally. Actually, uh, I am I would guess this unit is probably actually falling back to get more ammo. They're down to 
Uh, they might be going back to the bar skin line. Oh my lord, that artillery did so much damage there. That was a bunch of kills. Yeah, the artillery being able to catch enemies uh, while they're still on the road and mopped up together is proving to be a massive advantage. I'm really glad with the Russians dropping in the smoke here that we've got the helicopters to kind of be able to see beyond that smoke, see past it. being very glad that so many of the movement orders are uh, assault orders and not move hasty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because yeah. otherwise I think I'd be in a lot more trouble than I am. Yeah, on the one hand, you're, um, the northern flank, they're, um, they've really flown to the hornet's nest and taken some losses, but it looks like the Soviets on the eastern flank might just have their flank almost entirely open. Yeah, that's very much what it's looking like. We're not uh, yet at a point where the Bradleys have been able to kind of spot things. Um, so we'll have to see as that develops. This is very much we're getting all of this early intelligence thanks to these helicopters that move so quick. Um, that's really being a massive advantage to us. This is, I love this, this is more of those ATVs, but carrying some 120 millimeter mortars contributing to the fire support. Um, but yeah, the, the Bradleys, as quick as they move, can't get into position nearly as quickly as these helicopters can for get, gathering intelligence. The, the screen is just uh, a sea of red bodies here in this northern portion where the artillery was falling and the, some of our helicopters uh, took some massive revenge for the casualties they took. Got a... a Decent bit of uh, Russian artillery following where we don't have any troops at all, which is always nice. Happy for them to waste their firepower. Sucks if you live in this town, I suppose. It's a couple days in. Hopefully they've been evacuated by this point, but... Uh... yeah. Yeah, I, so I think this campaign starts on July 15th or so. So, yeah, we're like at least a week in. So hopefully knowing that the uh, Russians are coming this way, the, uh, the, the German paratroopers told all the <laughs> natives to uh, get out of Dodge. I was thinking, you know, I hit, you know, just kind of to keep the stream moving, uh, you know, I hit start kind of before what I would have probably normally done is take uh, all those M109s and have them put uh, mines out um, because that can be just a huge advantage for slowing down the Russian advance. Uh, we ended up not really having time for that, but uh, it looks like their HE is doing pretty solid work for us right now. On the one hand, you know, that our, that reconnaissance, uh, you know, drive was obviously really aggressive, but your artillery now is in action right at the start on, on some very prime targets right now. Yeah, like I'm seeing up north, you're, you're really racking up the kills there. Oh, but they're across the river on your, uh, on your southern flank. They are here. Um, and moving further south, uh, fortunately for us, I think that's going to be pretty bad for them because there's... A, uh, this anti-tank, I don't know what this is, a company or brigade or what, um, but, you know, it's a whole bunch of self-propelled anti-tank. It's the M901s. 
So as soon as they catch visibility of this, I imagine they're going to just rip it away and then keep on moving, not even caring, or staying in place long enough for artillery to catch it. Do we have, yeah, we've got some helicopters already back here doing rest and resupply because they've used up all their ammo already. And as soon as they're done with that rest and resupply, they'll take right back off and continue their hunt order. Um, which is honestly wonderful. And I think we've just got these two units of Apaches. Oh no, maybe, yeah, we've got three units of Apaches still have ammo. All the others have already used up all their ammo. Uh, oh, no, this guy still has some. Not much, though. All right, so we are uh, technically a little over time right now. Uh, is there anyone that's supposed to be streaming after us? I see Yog Dog is here, so I don't know if he is streaming. I'm just going to scroll down the calendar here real quick and double check. We're going to probably wrap up here anyway. Um, no, we don't have anybody that needs to stream after us at least, so... Yog Dog's going to do an unofficial stream. Okay, well, we'll try and wrap this up, Yog Dog. I'm just going to... So I do like uh, the scenario info. Yeah, look at that. 30 minutes in, we've taken 15% bite out of the enemy units so far. That's That feels good, you know? <laughs> that feels good. 4% um, casualties. This is I probably universally all in the helicopters. We lost, I think, most of those Kiowas, um, which is unfortunate. I think this is probably, yeah, we've got one Kiowa here, and um, our headquarters uh, that I accidentally <laughs> sent out to do reconnaissance as well. Um, So I would have liked to have had a little more time. It took us a little bit. This is a large enough scenario. It took a long time to get all the orders, uh, the starting orders issued. Um, but definitely we kind of see the advantage of having that, that tripwire out, that reconnaissance element out, where the artillery can get in some real work. If, I, if we take a moment to look at reported kills and claims, um, yeah, so this artillery unit has killed eight. Uh, mech, I believe, is going to be the IFVs, like BTRs, BRDMs, that sort of thing. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So eight not the BR, transports. Not the BRDMs, but uh, BTRs, and, BTRs and BMPs. Okay. Um, and five of the carried infantry. This one's pulled out uh, four kills and a couple of anti-tank units um this fire support four more transports with some infantry one of the hq oh no i'm sorry that's an at and an air defense which is nice um and yeah those apaches 10 kills on one 12 on another given pretty good uh, yeah <laughs> look at that 10 from these Apaches, 13 from these, 6 from this, a massive 24 from this one with 6 tanks, 10 more mech. So almost 100% hit rate out of those Hellfires, uh, which is absolutely spectacular. Oh, and a couple of transports. Uh, the transport's probably killed by the Gatling gun or the uh, rockets that they carry as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, almost 100% hit rate, I imagine, with those Hellfires. So we have, yeah, 30 tanks dead. 39 mech dead. That's that's uh, that's exactly what you're looking for out of kind of your reconnaissance and force from the, from the Apaches and uh, just being able to get early eyes with your artillery, uh, catching the enemy before they've able to get got 
before they're able to get really any uh, eyes of their own. Um, yeah, I think you definitely managed to catch them before they were able to deploy into any kind of formation. And then uh, I think I can kind of see how this scenario might be playing out too, because on that right flank, well, it looks like the Soviets left. You're right. Is uh, they might have advanced a little too far, and it, it looks like they might have their artillery completely exposed, and you could have your cavalry swoop right in and, and do some serious damage in their uh, in their rear areas. Yeah. And it's definitely like it would be tempting at this point to go, ah, I can immediately start advancing. Um, but I think this is one of those like yeah, you have to be patient, you know, we're 30 minutes in what can take up to eight hours for the whole scenario. Um, so, like, you know, we're, we're barely into this scenario, like we can definitely afford to take our time, um, see what's actually here. You know, let these Bradleys get into position, see what's here, see what we can't shoot just from where we're the positions we're going to take early on and see, because these are going to mostly be the Russian forward elements. This is, these are going to be their reconnaissance elements. They have a huge formation, so they can afford to have fairly large reconnaissance. Um, but, you know, this is still over 80 tanks over 80 armored carriers, over 80 infantry. Uh, their reconnaissance, it's not 60 to 70 anymore. We killed some. It's now 50 to 60. But like that still gives them a lot of reconnaissance. Uh, they still have 70 to 80 air defense. We've knocked out almost none of that. They still have um, uh, 1 to 10 self-propelled anti-tanks. We did do a number on their self-propelled anti-tank, but you know, infantry anti-tank is still 50 to 60. So like as tempting as it is to go, ah, we can now change these guys' orders to instead of assaulting into good overwatch positions on this hill edge, you know, assault forward. No, let's slow it down, take that look. And then if it looks like we could, we're not going to get overwhelmed if we advance. We can continue advancing here. Um, and this is, you know, if we were to take time to continue playing this forward, uh, we might choose to react to this a little differently, right? Because we've got all of these guys probably can take care of whatever is here just fine. But it's quite possible there is um, some infantry that the 901s just can't deal with. Um, they do have a machine gun, but, you know, that's not necessarily your weapon of choice. And so it might be better to uh, take some of these infantry and have them do an assault order into these guys to finish cleaning them up. Uh, because we're not likely necessarily to get all everything. There's going to be some stragglers, and we don't want those stragglers getting back here and spotting our artillery. So, is that where you guys want to wrap up, Liam and Jeff? Yeah, I think so. All right. Yeah, so um, like um, we said, there's um, on the Matrix uh, YouTube, there's a new video up on scouting and uh, reconnaissance. And we um, obviously, when, um, earlier in the Twitch video, we talked a lot about that. So if anybody wants to rewatch the stream, you know, if, you, if you're joining us late, you know, be sure to check it out. Um, we are making more tutorial videos going forward, so you can expect some more in the future on a variety of topics for Flashpoint campaigns is obviously this game is pretty intimidating and uh, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of features interacting with each other. So um, we figure some of those deserve some explanation, deserve some uh, advice from the, you know, the vets that made them and, and, and the, um, we're, we're very excited to be making these um, and very excited for Central Storm uh, as well. It's, um, it's, uh going to be exploring a lot of new content uh that uh, hasn't really been shown as much before you're going to see both the belgians for one thing coming up now you're going to have to deal with new problems um like uh formations only with leopard ones and not really many atgms you're, you're going to be dealing with some interesting problems going forward with the new uh content coming out for flashpoint campaigns so uh thanks for watching and um we'll hopefully do this again sometime uh pretty soon so stay tuned 
Uh, so that's going to be it for us today, guys. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, been happy to answer questions for you. I'm going to answer Mike's question here at the end. Um, I will probably not continue this save game uh, because this is scenario four in the campaign that I have been running in my developer stream on Saturdays. So uh, we'll probably not continue this particular save game, but we will get to this scenario mm, probably next month or even November. Uh, just takes us a bit to get through. Yogdog should ask about AMX 30s. Um, I don't know. Jeff, you would know more uh, where there might be a French unit deployed with AMX 30s. <laughs> Yogdog says no. <laughs> yeah, no AMX 30s. Um, Actually, I exercised once with 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 some with a French cavalry unit and did AMX 30s. I, oh, yeah? think were, I think there were stations somewhere near near Kaiserslautern. Okay. Uh, and and as far as scenarios go, I don't I don't know which scenarios got AMX stories. I'm pretty sure that we got them in there. Yeah. Um. So, uh, one of the reasons I'm not going to continue this save game is I figured we would do kind of an end game now here because that'll let us kind of peek behind the curtain. Um, and see where all of the Russian assets actually are. Um, and so we can see here, yeah, so we've got some anti-tank here. We've got, this is, I think, air defense. This is air defense, but yeah, so we've got anti-tank here and here, um, where if we had just assaulted blindly, we would probably weather this, but we would take more casualties than we necessarily need to. And so having those reconnaissance elements doing that job ahead of time um, lets us kind of more safely spot this and then we can assault in with the Abrams. Um, and here we can see, you know, we took a bite out of this attack. Um, and these uh, rec uh, Bradleys were kind of doing the sort of thing that I was kind of hoping they would be able to do is kind of, you know, spot anything that was up here. But also, if they can go unspotted, they'll be able to hit the enemy in the flank. Which, you know, even if they don't do any shooting themselves, they can spot for enemy artillery. This is kind of what we were talking about of, you know, we're just hitting the enemy leading edge. We're not necessarily seeing the bulk of the enemy still got a lot of stuff that we hadn't even come close to spotting yet so uh don't rush your scenarios have patience and we'll see you guys next time goodbye everybody bye everybody